Hello, my name is Rick Pearson, and this is Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. Harvard professor George St. Fianta is famous for this quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Today, Holocaust survivor Irving Roth is going to give us memories of the past direct from the largest death camp of World War II, Auschwitz, Poland. Stay tuned, you do not want to miss this. Welcome back to Prophecy USA. I'm currently in our U.S. office in Clearwater, Florida, while COVID-19 restrictions are being enforced throughout Canada. We're visiting various radio and TV and news stations throughout the U.S. doing interviews concerning our number one best-selling book on Amazon, The Hour That Changes Everything. You know, this book is a culmination of 35 years of research. It gives you an in-depth study of what ancient prophets foretold and what the book of Revelation reveals as to America's role in Bible prophecy. You know, Daniel was told to seal the book for it was not for him to understand the words he had written, but the mysteries would be revealed in the latter days. This book will unveil those mysteries in real time and show you the 53 descriptions of America as described in God's holy word. However, one of the most sobering revelations that I have ever experienced in my life was in April of 2019, when my wife Karen and I joined a small group of believers for an on-site history lesson from Holocaust survivor Irving Roth. You may never visit Auschwitz yourself, but you can still see with your eyes what happens when a nation leaves God and embraces the godless influence of secular humanism. We'll begin our introduction to Auschwitz exactly as Irving was introduced at the age of 14 years old. The door of a cattle car opened and Nazi soldiers pointed their bayonets at unarmed Jewish children and shouted, welcome to Auschwitz. Listen to this. It's three quarters of a century ago that I arrived in this place, in this type of a vehicle cattle car. And as you look at the cattle car, you see it, there is a lock. But in addition to the lock, there was also a seal on it to make sure it's not open until it left the ghetto and arrived in Auschwitz. However, as we left the ghetto in Hungary, crossed into Slovakia, and a day's day went by, and suddenly the train stops in the middle of nowhere. Along comes the guard and opens up sufficiently to be able to still contain the seal, but enough to be able to say something inside. And he says, where you're going, you don't need any money. So hand over all your Hungarian money, German money, and even dollars. And so that's what we did. Another hour, a few hours go by, and suddenly we're in another area where there's nothing in the middle of nowhere. Again, the opening of the door. I want all your watches, all your rings. And a third time. By the third time, this is the, just hassling and Imagine two days have gone by and you're inside this box. And my grandfather shouts out, he says, 
You asked us for money, we gave it to you. We give you everything else. So stop bothering us. And if you want to, you can shoot me. Now, at the time, my grandfather was 65 years old. And the guard in German says, get back in there, old man, or I'll shoot you. I give you this story because these people were in business for themselves. But essentially, they were not supposed to do that. It's supposed to all be gathered together, uh, pa repackaged, and sent to Berlin, to a central station with the gold and the money and everything else belongs to the government, of course. But all these people were in business for themselves. In many ways, one can look upon this behavior as a totally lawless society. Lawless in that every person who was in charge of a particular group, of a particular place, whether he was a mayor of a town or he was the head of the SS in a village, he became the law. As it was expressed once, uh, I remember reading something about this. Uh, one day, someone was complaining to uh, Himmler saying, I don't understand what's going on. I know in my unit there are a number of people who have Jewish blood in them. How can that be? After all, if you, by law, if you have three Jewish grandparents, you're all making a Jew, and that's it. But in my unit, in the SS unit, you have some people who have grandparents who are all four grandparents who are Jewish. And his answer was, I determine who is a Jew. So in many ways, it was really a lawless society. And so finally the train arrives, it stops. We actually stopped outside of the camp as we came in, remember, through that little entrance. We were outside. It was late afternoon. Eventually the train pulls in one of these three tracks. These three tracks were built in the spring of 1944. The reason they were, originally there was just one track coming in. Like from Slovakia, we may have had 50,000 people come, and that's about it, because that's all the Jews there were. Now a new transport is gonna come, the rest remnant of the Jewish people of Europe, from Hungary. Cost of three, half a million dollars, half a million people. And so they felt that when the trains come in, they may come in multiple trains at the same time. What are they gonna do? And so they split this up into three. So you have multiple areas where you could discharge people. So we arrive here. By the time my train is located approximately, where it was not remember, this is a very long piece of track. That's because there were 50 cars or 60 cars sometimes. And then the doors are slid open. And all you hear is, heraus, mach schnell, get out quickly. Take nothing with you. Leave everything in place. What did I have? I have the small little suitcase and some underwear and some food, but no, I'm no longer allowed to own that. I get off the train, behind me is my brother, behind him is my grandfather, grandmother, and 10 year old cousin, members of extended family. We get off the train. Nothing, we have nothing with us. And form lines. I was 14 years old and I'm looking around. Where is this place? Where am I? And as I turn, forming lines in this direction, on the right hand side and off to the left hand side, I see flames coming out of chimneys. My cousin turns to me and says, What kind of factory do you think this is? I do not remember my answer, but he did. In 1990, he was here with a group of students from Israel and relates his story. And so they asked, so what did your cousin Irving say? Well, you already don't know my cousin Irving. He turned to me and says, I know. You're gonna make soap out of us. But if I become a bar of soap, I refuse to bubble. You know, it's hard to believe that this actually happened just 75 years ago. And it's also very sobering to know that Hitler was not only voted in by secular humanists, but also Christians who abandoned their faith 
from in God we trust to in government we trust. Stay tuned as we continue our life lessons from Auschwitz with our tour guide, Holocaust survivor, Irving Roth. The United Nations has a 2030 agenda. The World Economic Forum has a great reset. The COVID-19 pandemic has an accelerated mandate. But as the new world order plans their world without God, nothing will be accelerated faster than the prophetic word God has spoken to the United States of America. It will be the hour that changes everything. Prophecy USA is proud to present their latest book, The Hour That Changes Everything. Together with our study guide and free app, prepare yourself for one of the greatest events in Bible prophecy. Go to prophecyusa.org or call the number on your screen now to make your donation of $35 or more and receive your copy of the book, The Hour That Changes Everything. We are waiting to hear from you. Call today. Welcome back. We're touring Auschwitz today with Holocaust survivor Irving Roth. Irving has told us of his shocking cattle car arrival into his prison camp, but what comes next is absolutely horrifying. And it's hard to imagine that these things actually happen, but Irving assures us they certainly did. Listen to this. And so standing in formation like this and suddenly the whole line begins to move. Suddenly, I'm facing a man in uniform, dressed beautifully with shiny boots and a riding crop in his hand. And he says very little. He just moves his riding crop, rests on links to the right and to the left. <coughs> Most of the people are going to the right in this direction. A few to the left. Very soon, I lose sight of my grandfather and grandmother, my aunt, my 10-year-old cousin, because they're going this direction. Buildings that have chimneys and flames. We marched over to the left, under guard, of course, to another part of the camp, and we walking into a barracks-like thing, and the number of chairs there, and people who have shears in their hands, and tell us to get undressed, take our clothing away. So now I have nothing of mine except a pair of boots. But eventually I lose that too. They shave us, they spray us with something, probably a disinfectant, and now I'm wearing a striped gray and blue pair of pants, jacket and hat, and stand in formation four hours and then It is now midnight maybe, maybe one o'clock in the morning, and we haven't eaten in a while. We have not been able to go to the, to relieve ourselves. Haven't gotten any water. And finally they tell us we, mu we must enter a building. And in this building, there's nothing but on both sides, what I call shelves, deep six foot shelves. One close to the ground, another one about two feet above that, two feet more and two feet more. And that's where all of us are supposed to go and sleep. And we do because it's late at night. We're hungry, thirsty, can't leave. And of course, within minutes, most of us are asleep in this very strange place. But before we turn around, it's morning. The whistle is blowing. Everybody out, at us, information, we're counted. And then a marvelous piece of information. You now may enter the latrine. We'll visit one of those. It's not exactly something that uh, you would want to spend any time in. But it was, and you'll see it later on, it's a slab of concrete. The length of the whole barracks with holes side by side. And on either side is a pipe and in spaces about a couple of feet apart, 
There's a spigot. Love my friends. Goes the bathroom. But not that you could sit there as long as you wanted. Very quickly, we told to get out. I mean, standing in formation again in front of our building. And suddenly I see that a number of uh, people, maybe a half a dozen, are bringing along small little desk, like a school desk. And next to each one of those desks is a chair. And we call to sit down one at a time to these places, roll up our sleeves. It takes out a hypodermic needle. At least it looked that way to me. And an inkwell fills it up with ink, tells me to roll up my sleeves, and suddenly begins to poke my hand very quickly as I look down. Now I have a number tattooed on my arm. I'm no longer a person with a name. I am now a number. I am branded <coughs> just the way cattle is branded. I'm the property of the German government. That they made sure that I understand. And besides that, once it's tattooed, you can't take it off. And therefore, should you be by any strange and stretch of the imagination escape, they'll find you. They know where you're from. That, my friends, was my introduction to this place of Auschwitz II, the death camp. 1.1 million people of Jewish faith were brought here. Maybe 1.2 million. Some others, too. This is where they were murdered. In a period of two years, or maybe 28 months, 1.1 million Jews, 10% of the Jewish population of all of Europe, was brought here in that period of time and murdered. Based on propaganda and lies, things which have absolutely nothing to do with the reality. That, my friends, is the scary part. It all began with words. In Germany, it began with words at the bottom of a newspaper. On top is the name, the Sturmer the stormtrooper on the bottom in German. The Jews are our misfortune. They are the cause of every problem. You read article after article in the Sturmer. It began in the 1920s. Nobody paid attention. By 1932, that political party and as you saw, the, num the name of that in the exhibit, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, it was the largest single party in Germany, and they were elected to run the government. Folks, I want you to think about what Irving just told us. The Nazi Socialist Party was elected to run the government. You know, in 605 BC, the prophet Jeremiah wept before Israel was handed over to the Babylonian rule, and she was judged severely for her sins. They were shedding innocent blood in the name of Baal worship because they thought they would be rewarded financially by this pagan god, Moloch. It had become the law of the land and embracing by, by those who were in leadership. But Jeremiah rebuked the people saying, you have strengthened the hands of evildoers. Think about that, folks, the next time you cast your vote for the policies of a political party, because God is watching. We'll be right back. Hey, folks, have you ever been witnessing to somebody and you just can't remember verses or recall the 
eight providential nations in Scripture, let alone how America meets all 53 descriptions of the seventh nation in Bible prophecy? Well, now Prophecy USA has a free app, and every TV program, podcast, and all 53 descriptions of America's role in Bible prophecy will be in the palm of your hand. Together with our study guide, you can study to show thyself approved at any time, any place, and at any given moment. You can even upload the app onto your friend's phone or iPad and let them find out for themselves where this generation fits on God's prophetic time clock. To get the free app, go to prophecyusa.org. And for a donation of $20 or more, we will include a 100-page study guide boldly proclaiming America's role in Bible prophecy. 2,000 years ago, innocent blood was shed for you. But will America come back? Will she seek God's forgiveness or will she suffer His judgment? Prophecy USA proudly presents a study guide addressing America's spiritual state of the union concerning her past, present, and future role in Bible prophecy. Call right now with your donation of $20 or more to receive your copy, 1-888-306-1759. Or go online to prophecyusa.org right now. Welcome back to our tour of Auschwitz. I want you to listen carefully as Irving Roth, Holocaust survivor, unveils not only the history of German concentration camps, but gives us a hint of the future plans of the Antichrist. Watch how methods of tracking Jewish inmates of 1942 concentration camps reflect the new high-tech policies that the Bible foretells is coming with the New World Order. Listen to this. The Nazi party came to power through the ballot. People were convinced through propaganda that the reason World War I was fought is because of the Jews. Absolutely nothing to do with the Jews. The fact that Germany lost the war, World War I that is, is the fault of the Jews. The reason you don't have a job in Germany in the 1920s, because of the Jews. The reason you have inflation and depression is because of the Jews. World depression was caused by the Jews, not by the stock market, not by the manipulation, but by the Jews. And people are convinced. Of that. There's another piece to it. The propaganda against the Jews was one piece, but there's a second piece. I call it seduction. They use it very, very strongly. How do you go from a number of people, maybe a dozen, maybe two, maybe seven, of this ideology called National Socialism to the Holocaust? How do you convince people? A part of it, of course, began with convincing ex-army people to vote for this political party. How is it? Very simply. Remember, the Versailles Treaty prohibited Germany from having an army. So imagine you're a colonel in the German army during World War I, and now suddenly there is no army. You have no job. You have no skills other than being a colonel. What do you do? How do you feed your family? Along comes the Nazi party and says, we will reinstate the army. You will become a colonel again. People will not only respect you, but salute you. And you'll be able to support your family in great style. Oh, by the way, it's all the fault of the Jews. The second piece is seduction. And once that happens, and that happens, by the way, interestingly enough, they take power as you well know, at the beginning of 1933, in fact, in January. The first anti-Jewish law comes about 60 days later. That law says that do not buy anything from a Jew. Do not use any Jewish products. 
Jewish stores have to be marked by a Jewish star with the word Yuda. In front of the stores are members of the Nazi party, stormtroopers in uniform with clubs convincing you you shouldn't go in and support these terrible people who are at fault that you don't have a job. And so within a matter of weeks, the first step is boycott. And that is why when 10 years ago the concept of a boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israel came along, I screamed and yelled at the top of my voice. That's the first step, guys. Unfortunately, people don't always pay attention. Because after all, did the German people stop buying Jewish products? No. So financially, it was not a success. But politically, emotionally, and psychologically, it was the first step and accepted. I called those signposts along the road to Auschwitz. The signs were there, big and bold. Nobody bothered to them. If there's one thing we need to learn from the Holocaust, is those signposts along the road. And when we see them, you must recognize them. There are those in the world today who would like to repeat this with a vengeance, with more modern technology. That's why I thank you for being here this early in the morning, listening to me. So tomorrow and the next day, we can look at the headlines in the newspaper. So tomorrow we can listen to the radio and to the talking heads philosophizing about oppression, about Jews. So sometimes we think in terms of it was a closed society, nobody knew. People knew, the world knew. And they looked down and said what we always say, it ain't my problem. You know, we stated in the last segment that Hitler was voted into power not only by secular humanists, but also by naive Christians. However, some did not fall for the propaganda that the socialists were peddling. One Luther minister named Dietrich Bonhoeffer raised up a shout against Hitler and tried to warn people what was coming. Now, sadly, most people did not listen, and Bonhoeffer was eventually arrested by the German Gestapo, taken to a concentration camp, and on April 9th of 1945, he was, he was hanged. The Bible says that before Latter-day Babylon is judged by fire, his people are going to raise up a shout of warning against her. But my question is, will we be like Bonhoeffer, or will we be like those who cannot remember the past and are condemned to repeat it? We're out of time, folks. My name is Rick Pearson, and I'm reminding you that Jesus is alive, and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. See you next week on Prophecy USA.